I wonder if we could just have a word of prayer, we'll just glance through the centuries, just very briefly, and Mary will come and continue just at this point. Shall we have a word of prayer? Our Father, we do thank Thee for the ministry of the Holy Ghost. We thank Thee for the revelation of God's Spirit and the revelation of Jesus. We commit ourselves to Thee, Lord. Here we are at this very important juncture of our lives. This could be a turning point in each one of our lives. We could meet Thee this day, this conference. We could come to Thee anew, find new refreshing streams from heaven entering into our souls, setting us ablaze, sending us forth as new men and women. Come with the refreshing streams from heaven, Lord. Come and touch all our lives at this time that we might hear and know and see and receive the glory of God in our own lives also. We thank thee for everyone who is here this morning. Oh, may we all catch something from heaven. For Jesus' sake, amen. Just a brief historical look at the plan of God in revival, and then Mary will speak now. Thank you. Well, I would much rather be sitting down there than being up here. But uh, I have to be. They tell us, women, that we ought to be obedient, so there we are. Ezekiel chapter 37. <coughs> it's good to be with you here at the conference. It's been a joy down through the years to pray for OM, for the ministry of the ships and the rest of the ministries throughout the world. Our hearts are in this work and we ourselves are engaged in this work. There are times when God raises up yet another society and boosts on his cause throughout the world. And that is what he has been doing in bringing OM into being in this century. In the faith mission we'll be celebrating our centenary next year. And for these hundred years, young people just like you have gone out into the highways and byways, the villages of Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales and have joined societies propagating the gospel to the ends of the earth. Hundreds of them, thousands of them, down the years. And they've been doing exactly what you're doing now, trying to reach men for Christ. The founder of the Faith Mission said, when the Faith Mission ceases to be a soul-saving agency, it doesn't deserve to exist. Well, it hasn't stopped yet in being an agency to bring the lost to Christ. Maybe it's hard in these days, and as our workers are gathered together now, uh, starting tomorrow with conferences, just as we are here, they will be relating stories from all over the country, from their summer campaigns, telling of the victories and the hardships of yet another season in the Lord's service. And they will be joined by the young people from the Bible school and they will be going out at the, in the beginning of October to uh, the villages from Cornwall right up until the very north coast of Scotland and possibly some of the islands proclaiming the gospel and spending their winter months, some of them living in caravans and some of them living in homes, some of them living in halls, and they will be going from door to door, holding meetings, going to school assemblies, uh, having children's meetings, all the things that OM do, they will be doing throughout the villages in England, Scotland, and Ireland. So the work of God goes on. But we are here this morning to talk together about the possibility and the plan on the program of a spiritual awakening because you realize as much as I do 
in the work of God that without him we can do nothing. And I could keep you here all day telling you stories of how God brought us to the point in different missions where this realization burns within our hearts, where God takes over and God begins to move in his own miraculous way, bringing men and women to Christ. And that work depending not upon us, but upon himself, the workings and strivings of his spirit and our obedience to stay humble before him. Ezekiel chapter 37 tells us, relates a period of spiritual awakening, beautifully illustrated in the story of the dry bones. It's one of my favorite Old Testament portions. It begins very pointedly by saying, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest again he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will put sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. There were no mistakes. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Ending at verse 14. And may God bless to us this reading from his word. A thrilling chapter, isn't it? You notice I read from the authorised version. You see, I'm one of these old fogies from the past who used to learn scripture off by heart from the authorised version up there in the Hebrides, and I'm not going to change now, because I can't. I've got more than a half century behind me, and I'm not going to change. But, you see, these things, I never had any problem at all with the authorised version. Maybe to begin with, when I was at school and before I was saved. But the Bible says these things are spiritually discerned. So whatever translation you have, it's not by my mentally understanding it that it's going to transform me, but by my spiritually understanding it that it's going to transform my life. You've got that, haven't you? Well, the hand of the Lord was upon me. That's the secret of revival. That's the secret of revival, the hand of God being upon my life. And isn't that the thrill of revival? And is that not the thrill of Christian experience that God, the sovereign Lord, the great and terrible God of whom Daniel speaks, the one who dwells in light that no man can approach, 
who sitteth upon the circumference of the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that that God, the sovereign Lord, who created this world, who brought it into being, who is infinite, omnipotent, that this same God should put his hand upon a mere finite man or woman. That to me is thrilling. That to me is amazing. That to me is surprising. That God should put his hand upon a man. And I'm going to begin with the man. Who was he anyway? And you've got to ask that question about every man. Down through the centuries who was used in spiritual awakening. Who was used of God in any way. Well who were they? God didn't choose them because of their pedigree. God chose them because he wanted to. And that is a profound spiritual truth put in simple terms. Because he wanted to. It's not for us to search out why. The wonder for us is that he did it. And that he still does it. That he takes a man from obscurity. That he takes him from nowhere. And he doesn't recite the pedigree for us. He says here, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Who was he? He was a prophet. The prophet Ezekiel. He was God's mouthpiece. But he was only a man. An ordinary man, as you and I would talk of. But spiritually he was not ordinary. And the reason why he was not ordinary was that the hand of the Lord was upon him. Now you can tell a person upon whom God's hand is. Somehow they're different. There's a light on their face that is not of this world. It's not the charm of human personality. It is what the Bible calls the beauty of the Lord our God. And it doesn't depend upon the beauty that you and I behold. The beauty of the flesh. There are lots of beautiful people around upon whom God has not put his hand. And there are a lot of people around who are not so beautiful and God hasn't put the, his hand upon them. There was a little hunchback in our district. He was an elder in the church, although he could seldom be there because of ill health. And during this spiritual awakening, it was John's chief delight to stand in the window and look out at the crowds as they walked past to the church for in these days we walked most of the time walking three miles to church was nothing not if there was something going on you wanted to be there and John used to stand in the window and he said on one occasion to me you know Mary I can tell the ones whom God has touched just by looking at their faces not because there was a perpetual grin on their faces that's a different thing. It was something that came from within. It was something that was spontaneous, not put on, but spontaneous from the heart. God transforms men and women from within. And then it shows outwardly. And John recognized the hand of God upon men and women and young people and the hand of the Lord was upon him you're all students of the Bible I hope I'll give you some illustrations or examples of God's hand being upon this man you can work them out for yourself what does the hand of God do when he puts his hand upon a man or a woman Well, sometimes he chastises him to begin with, doesn't he? 
whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Are you surprised sometimes when some of God's people upon whom he puts his hand suffer? Because God puts his hand upon people and sometimes they suffer. And the world looking on says, well, why this? Why is this person suffering? Oh, it's because God doesn't exist. No, it isn't. It's because God does exist. And because God is a righteous God. And he requires righteousness of his people. And he meets with them. And he purges them. He says so in his word. He says, I will purge you. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi. And try them even as gold is tried. Some people when they face suffering become bitter. But others become sweet. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Well, the hand of the Lord mercifully possesses the one upon whom he puts his hand, doesn't he? He possesses young man went to university and came home grief-stricken and told his mother, I've met so many Christians, but I've met so few dedicated ones. Are you a dedicated OMR? Are you just a Christian? Possesses. The hand of the Lord possesses. So that the person who is chastised, searched, convicted, convinced, becomes possessed. And that's why they sing, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Others don't understand, but he possesses them entirely. And sometimes they, in the eyes of the world, go to extremes in the giving of themselves to the cause of Christ. like William Carey cobbling away there on the street, cobbling shoes, mending shoes. And someone said to him, what do you do? What do you do for a living? He says, I'm a missionary and I cobble shoes to pay expenses. You see, he had it right. Possessing. Then our hand of the Lord wonderfully provides, doesn't he? Oh, yes, he provides for those who launch out into his service having nothing. And some of you could give numerous testimonies of the Lord's gracious provision for those upon whom he puts his hand. Well, we could go along on that line. My husband is getting nervous because the time is going on. You see, I know him now. <laughs> he wonders whenever I'll come to the end of this. Well, we better push on. There's a lot that we could say upon the hand of the Lord being upon a man. I remember the hand of the Lord being upon a young man in Lewis. He was 16 years of age and he was called Little Donald and he was six foot four at that time. He had outgrown his name somehow. But he used to hide at the back of the meeting. He was nobody. He was just the son of a crofter in the community. He wasn't a public personality. He was just a crofter's boy, and he used to hide. And Duncan Campbell recognized that the hand of God was upon that young man, and he used to ask him to pray. And I remember him praying one night in the police station. The policeman was a Christian, and the police station was chock-a-block with men and women seeking God. It was a cottage meeting. And Mr. Campbell said, Will young Donald now please pray for little Donald? And little Donald got up, his full six foot four, and bent his head, clasped his hands together as a boy would in school. <clears throat> and he said one word, Father. And that whole meeting melted into tears. 
because the Spirit of God was upon him and as he said that word Father that meeting realized the meaning and saw the meaning and the wonder of the fact that here we were saved by sovereign grace and we could turn to the God who dwells in life that no man can approach and we could say Father Father oh the thrill but the hand of the Lord was upon the lad and that's what you and I need as we go forth into the world. That God, the sovereign God, should put his hand upon us and possess us, chastise us if he may, provide for us as he will, and send us forth as men and women in the world whom the world looking on recognize as men and women of God. They ought to, you know. Because we belong to another world. We are strangers and pilgrims in the earth. The man, the mission field. What mission field did God send Ezekiel to? He sent him to a very hard mission field, very unresponsive mission field. Don't we like it when we are called to adorn the platform or otherwise and in front of us a crowd of enthusiastic Christians saying Amen and praise the Lord to everything we say thrilling isn't it that wasn't the kind of mission field there were no Amens and no Hallelujahs from the Valley of Dry Bones there was no response that was the mission field and I must hurry on the mission field that he was sent to was the people of God. God said so. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Now you go to a community, I go to a community, and there are Christians there, but all oh, the deadness. What are we going to do? Cast them aside and start a show of our own. Doesn't work that way. A spiritual revival begins with these dead bones. And it's hard work to get down to praying and seeking God and seeing these dry bones come to life. But that's where revival begins. The tendency in our day is to throw aside the church as being antiquated, out of date and dead and so on well all these things may be true but if these people were born again of the spirit of God there are seasons of slumber in the church but a spiritual awakening begins there revival it is it's revival these people who were awakened must be awakened again. And it's when these people are awakened that the world begins to take note that something is happening. The world will congregate to see the church on fire. And so the mission field is the hard mission field of the people of God who are sitting there by the, on this occasion by the river cable mourning and groaning dejected and weeping having hung up their harps on the willows having said we cannot sing the song of Zion in a strange land we are cut off for, for our parts we are away from our spiritual home we are away from Jerusalem and the temple and all that that means and here we are sitting dejected weeping captives by the river Kaba. But this man, instead of criticizing them, what did he do? He wept with them. And these are the kind of people whom God wants. The kind of people who will identify with them and who will pray through with them. 
and you will see God coming in the midst. And it isn't just when they begin to sing happy choruses that a spiritual awakening begins. More often than not, it is when they are smashed and broken in the presence of God. And the tears of joy mingle with the tears of sorrow and conviction as God invades the scene. The mission field. A valley of dry bones dry and scattered the one from the other and isn't that a picture of many a congregation you stand to minister in front of them and they're not a complete unit united as the disciples in the upper room they come from all directions and they go in all directions and there is no cohesion in the midst but when God invades the scene there is a unity that can be felt that can be sensed there is a oneness of purpose. There is a oneness of vision. There is a blending together. But how is that going to come about? The ecumenists say, well, let's go down to the valley and bring the bones together. And so they descend, be robed into the valley, and they bring the bones together and they make beautiful skeletons. And no life. You can put a row as long as you like of dead batteries and a torch and you'll get no no light now we come to the important part isn't it where we find God's program how how does it come about a spiritual awakening what must we do must we get up and entertain the bones must we get up and sing nice songs to them well, in my experience, it didn't happen that way. We don't get up and do anything. We get down before God. And we begin to seek Him as we've never sought Him in our lives. And when the heavens seem to be as brass, we still seek Him. I remember missioning in one place for seven long weeks. And the church we were missioning in, in the island of Tyree, in a little place called Cornick, the church was not used. The windows were broken, so we left the shutters up to save us from the drafts in the winter time. Draft came under the door, no heating in the church, not of any kind. And some nights we came along to the church for our meeting, and we only had the two of us. And I still recall putting our raincoats under our knees at the front and getting down to pray for the duration of the meeting. Then going out and visiting the people from house to house, from door to door, going back round them again. We haven't seen you, being friendly to them. Come on, come out to the meeting. But if I come, then everybody will look at me. No, but everybody's in the same boat. They're not going to look at you because they're in the same boat. Come along, come to the meeting. Come and see anyway. We'll sing, we'll sing the Gallic hymns and, and we'll, have, we'll have meetings and you'll enjoy it. Come on. And we'd go back, spend every morning in prayer. We had some hardships too. I could tell you about that too. But nevertheless, on we went, seven weeks. And then one morning as we prayed, my fellow worker began to laugh as she prayed. Now, my background was Presbyterian from the islands, and you don't laugh in prayer meetings. <laughs> but she laughed. And then she said, she said, praise God, she said, the devil's on the run. He's on the way out, and God has come. And in the afternoon, an old man approached the house came to the door I still see him quite a sight he was carrying a cockerel newly killed in one hand he had it by the legs and his pockets were bul bulging with eggs and he offloaded onto the table he says that's for you and then he took his old cap off and he said come here and he got down on his knees in the sitting room 
And he said, pray for me. I'm an old sinner and I need to be saved. And that was the beginning. And that night at the meeting, 70 people. And some of them carrying heaters with them. And after the service, a fine young man comes back down to the front. He says, I'm not going home from here tonight till I get saved. And the news of his salvation spread through the island and they came from all directions. And the Spirit of God began to work. And one after another, they began to come to Christ. God's methods, God's program of revival now, what do we do? He says, Son of man, speak. That's it. Son of man, speak. And he says, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, and a command from heaven, Hear the word of the Lord. Young people and older people. This is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. This is the sword that God has given to us. Let us have full confidence. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There it is. Prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them what? The truth. O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's the truth. What do you say to your congregation? What a fine people you are. Great people. Wonderful people. Lovely people. Glad you're here. Doing the Almighty a favor by coming to hear me tonight. Oh no. O oh, ye dry bones, you'll insult your congregation sometimes by telling them the truth. But it's the truth from God. My husband spoke of W.P. Nicholson. The thing about W.P. Nicholson was this, that he told the people the truth, and sometimes in the most quaint way and in the most pointed way, and he used to insult them left, right, and center as they walked into the meeting. Some of these fine ladies coming in, strutting in, looking for a seat as if they were to be the center of attraction. And one time he looked at this one coming in and he said, she couldn't find a seat. And he said, will you blackbirds there shift over a bit while this canary comes in? She was dressed in yellow. <laughs> Not asking you to do that. W.P. Nicholson could do that. That was just him. He was just being himself. And he used to intentionally insult people because he knew that if he did that publicly in the meeting, hundreds of people would come the following night because they heard what he did the previous night. <laughs> and he would give them the gospel. And God used him mightily. He would have them laughing one moment. He would have them crying their hearts out the next moment. But God was there. That was it. And God made this man, and when he made him, he broke the mold. There hasn't been another W.P. Nicholson. Nor has there been another Wesley or whichever way God has made a man. He makes him, and then he breaks the mold. Oh, ye dry bones! Are we afraid to tell them the truth? Some ministers are, you know, because some of these fine people in the congregation, they put a lot into the offering. And you mustn't insult them. Oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. We need men and women these days who are not afraid of men and women. Who are only afraid of God. Who fear God. Five minutes to lunchtime. You hungry? Oh, ye dry bones. And as he spoke. The miracle happened. So I prophesied, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, blessed noise, 
and a shaking. I remember people shaking in the Hebrides revival, shaking so much that I was afraid I'd be infected as a young person. I used to hold on to my seat in case I would shake, but they actually shook. That's why the Quakers were called Quakers, because at the beginning they used to quake. But that's scriptural. To this man will I move Luke, the man that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. The Bible says so. And there was a shaking, there was a noise, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. It seems like disorder, but it is glorious order when God is in control. He knows which bones belong in the right place. I could do with another long time. There's so much in this chapter. But then we have the sinews and the flesh coming up upon them. And we have not skeletons but corpses. And a corpse can look very beautiful, but it's dead. Son of man, prophesy. There, all the way through, it's a preaching of the word of God, not the comments that I made, made on the word of God, but the word of God. You know, the first time Billy Graham came to Scotland, I remember listening to him in the Kelvin Hall, and the strength of Billy Graham's ministry was this, in Scotland at that time. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And although Scottish people had long since left the Bible on their shelves, there was still that little bit of the fear of God in their hearts and the appreciation of what the Word of God had done and the authority of Billy Graham at that time was the Bible says. In the Lewis Revival, the authority that was on Duncan Campbell, the Spirit of God was upon him, was this, that his whole ministry was every night from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible says, the Bible says, and the Bible says, and I sat as a young person in the presence of God, feeling that I wasn't arguing with Duncan Campbell, I was arguing with God Almighty, because it was he who said these things that were being proclaimed in the power of the Spirit before me. Son of man, prophesy! And speak, say to the four winds, O breath, breathe upon the slain that they may live. That's it. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they lived and they stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. What's an army for? Fighting, of course. These bones that were scattered and dried and hopeless and helpless and unattractive. Now, instead of that, we have a completely transformed situation when they are standing on their feet ready to receive the command and they're on their feet as a great army ready for action and listed ready to fight that is revival I was in a meeting in Stornoway and with this I close in the Hebrides one night and there were some visitors from the mainland they didn't know revival. The preacher had preached, a young man from the faith mission, who himself had been saved in the newest revival. And as he preached, young people came under conviction of sin, a sight frequently seen in days of revival, and they were weeping. The meeting is over and there was no appeal made. And one of the gentlemen from the mainland felt that they had missed out. And he went to the leader of the meeting and he says, look, he says, these young people are in distress. 
Won't you make an appeal that they'll come out and be dealt with? He said, brother, they are being dealt with. <clears throat> Leave them alone. And after the meeting was over, these young people, as the old Puritans used to say, wrought upon by the Spirit of God, rose from their seats and gathered in a group together and they invaded the town of Stormwind late at night without any organization. What was happening? That which they had received. If these should keep silent, the very stones would cry out. They wanted to tell somebody. They wanted to tell everybody spontaneously what had happened to them. They couldn't contain what they had received. The water that I shall give them, said Jesus, shall be in them a perennial spring, springing up unto everlasting life. And so they spilt out on the streets and they were there until the early hours of the morning. The men who came out of the public house, they met them, these youngsters, telling them about the plan of salvation, what the Lord had done for them in that meeting. And that night the town was alive with what was happening. That is a spiritual awakening. That is the work of God. Oh, may God, as I so often say in prayer, do it again. Thank you. 